Hi everyone, I'm Ben and you're watching The Snecker Show. And in this episode, which will be part of a longer series, we're going to take a look at something that I'm inventing or trying to invent to, uh, to work around the house. Now, for as long as I can remember, I've been doing my own home repairs. Uh, and this uh, started at a pretty early age. I think I was around 12 when I repaired a shelf in my parents' house. I still remember it because it was kind of a, a big moment for me that I had, for the first time ever, fixed something in the house without any kind of assistance. Uh, this can be pretty enjoyable for most projects, but there are a couple of places that I really hate working, and uh, two of those include the attic and the crawl space. Now, in case you're not familiar with a crawl space or what that is, it's kind of like a mini basement that's underneath uh, some houses, depending on how they're built, and you can get access to like electrical and plumbing under there. Uh, and it's called a crawl space because there is usually not enough room to stand up. Every house I've lived in before this one was built on a concrete slab, so when we moved in, I really didn't have a lot of experience with crawl spaces, but I had to step up my game pretty quickly because right after we moved in, I found out that the copper plumbing uh, underneath the house was leaking in several areas, and this is in the oldest part of the house because there, there was an addition. So I crawled under there and planned out the new stuff and replaced all the copper with PEX, at least in the oldest part of the house. A couple years later, middle of the winter in fact, uh, I heard some dripping inside the wall and it turns out that the copper pipe had uh, broken in several places in the newest part of the house, in the addition. So I had to crawl under into a lake in the middle of the winter and rip out all of that copper and replace that with PEX. And then several years later, the copper in the, the last remaining part of the house that I hadn't touched, which is right here in my workshop, uh, started to leak and that pipe runs underneath the concrete slab in my workshop so that was a little bit more tricky and uh, I finally replaced all of that with PEX and that was also the same time I invented these uh, these uh, plumbing hanging brackets that I made out of wood that allow you to secure both the pipe and the insulation at the same time. Well every time I finish working on one project in the crawl space I tell my wife finally it's done I never have to go underneath the house again and then of course something else surprises me. I want to clarify before we start, this is not going to be a build video. I'm not going to show how to make anything here. I'm just going to go over the, the concept of what I'm building and show you the prototype that I have so far. If that's all you want to see, you can jump forward to the end and it'll be there for you. But the reason I'm doing a background video is because this channel isn't just about building stuff. You can find how to build stuff anywhere. A lot of woodworking channels on YouTube or a lot of, a lot of books you can buy. Uh, if you want to find that stuff, it's out there. But part of this channel is also about figuring stuff out and solving problems. So in this case, I had a problem that I needed to solve related to working on the house. I didn't have a solution readily available and I looked around for what I thought might solve my problem and it wasn't commercially available either. So I had to identify my requirements, come up with some kind of a plan, make some prototypes, and that's the stage that I'm at right now. So I am explaining the background so that you kind of understand how I got to this state in case you got to go through a similar process. Several months ago, in the middle of the winter, I woke up in the middle of the night and it was just freezing cold in the house. And I uh, reached over and grabbed my phone and pulled up the thermostat app and checked it and it said it didn't have any connection with the thermostat. So I crawled out of bed reluctantly and walked down the hall and went to the actual thermostat and it said that it wasn't getting any electricity. So at that point I had to start doing some troubleshooting and I thought, well, could be some bad wiring, could be a bad thermostat, could be that a breaker tripped. Um, and it could also be the GFCI, the ground fault circuit interrupter outlet that's underneath the house because it's designed to, to trip if there's some kind of a short or, uh, you know, if something gets too wet. So uh, first I checked the, the uh, thermostat by pulling it off and putting it back on and still hadn't, didn't have a connection. Went into the garage and checked the circuit breakers, nothing had tripped. So I knew it was probably the GFCI under the house in the crawl space, my least favorite place in the world. So I had to crawl under the house again in the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter, in the middle of a rainstorm. And when I got underneath the house, I found that I was now the proud owner of a private indoor swimming pool. Well, what happened is that uh, we were getting some heavy rain and the water was getting in around the foundation and just started to fill up the crawl space. At one point, the water level was high enough that it contacted the wiring for the condensate pump, which is the... Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a little box that'll go next to an air conditioning system that pumps the water out, the condensation, when the air conditioning is running. And uh, it's designed so that if that thing fills up before it overflows, it'll shut off, and that shuts off the air conditioning unit, and that's so that your house doesn't flood. 
Well, this was a little bit different. The water wasn't coming from the inside, getting pumped out. The water was outside rising up and it contacted some wires that were too close to the ground and tripped the GFCI, which shut off the condensate pump, which shut off the whole heating and air unit for the house. At that point, it was low enough that I could crawl in there and, you know, fun thing to do is to crawl into, a, into the water that caused an electrical short and reset the outlet <laughs> that uh, shorted. But, uh, you know, that's what you got to do to keep the baby warm at night. So I crawled in there, hit the GFCI. I could see that the wiring was no longer in the water, so I didn't feel too concerned about that. And that turned the air conditioning back on, or rather the heat. Uh, everything just started right up, and I went inside and was able to go back in the bed and stare at the ceiling for the rest of the night, wondering what the heck happened. One of the problems that really had me confused was why did I never notice water under the house before? What changed? Why was there water now and I'd never before seen that I had an indoor swimming pool? Well, I had done some landscaping in the front of the house last year and I brought about five tons of dirt in and raked it out along the front of the house because uh, the, the dirt had washed away, washed away all the grass, washed away all the topsoil. And I thought maybe that was holding some more water against the house. That was one of my, my uh, first hypotheses. And I thought maybe uh, maybe the foundation cracked because there's a, a, a mine uh, close enough that you can sometimes feel the ground shake uh, when, they're, when they're doing blasting. So maybe the foundation cracked and that was allowing some water to get in. Uh, you know, I had a few different ideas, but what I, I finally settled on is that I think this has been going on for a lot longer than I, I thought initially, probably for as long as we own the house and, and much longer. There are some water marks around the, uh, the perimeter of the crawl space. And uh, the, there were some wet spots on the plastic, but I thought that was just from, from the, the pipes leaking over the years. And maybe it was just some, some uh, leftover, some pipes breaking and filling up the, you know, some low spots in, on the plastic, and that just left a dirt ring when the water settled back down. I think what actually happened is that this has been going on since we moved in, and I've just never noticed, because every time I've gone under the house to do some work before, like plumbing, I try to plan it out so that I can do the actual pipe repair, the, you know, the big job, when there's no rain outside or when the ground is dry and the weather is favorable. So I think that every time I've done that, the water, every time the crawl space is flooded, the water has just settled back down uh, before I actually got under there, so I never knew there was a problem. While I didn't have a lot of experience with crawl spaces before I moved into this house, I did have quite a bit of experience with water management from pretty much everywhere I've lived since I was a kid. Now, if you're getting water inside your house, there are three general approaches that you can take to fix it. One is to move the water away from your house, either by uh, raising up the ground to slope it away from the foundation or installing some kind of drainage system. The second is to seal your foundation so the water just can't get in. And the third is to install a, like a sump pump so that it removes the water as soon as it gets inside. In my case, I'm following all three approaches incrementally just to get a little bit uh, done at a time. But for a quick win, I installed a sump pump so that the water never gets up to the level it did before. While I was doing some research, I learned about crawl space encapsulation, which is the practice of completely sealing a crawl space with heavy plastic and insulation, rather than just throwing down some six mil vapor barrier on the ground. I mean, this is the real deal with actual taped sealed joints and everything, taped to the walls, taped to the columns, everything is completely sealed. Now, there are several benefits to encapsulating a crawl space. It's going to save you electricity by maintaining the temperature on the inside, it's going to reduce the moisture levels, which is going to mean less mold and rot. And it's uh, going to help uh, avoid failing insulation. Sometimes the insulation will get wet and it gets heavy and then just drops down. And it's also going to help reduce radon gas levels. That's something I never really thought about before. I mean, I've, I've heard of radon gas, but I never really looked into it too much. Well, apparently radon gas tends to be higher in some areas than others. My area has high radon gas levels, and I got around to buying a meter finally and took some measurements inside my house. Turns out my house has very high radon gas levels too. These are some things that had to get dealt with. Now the downsides to doing a full encapsulation is that it is very expensive if you're gonna have somebody else do the job for you, if it's gonna be done right. And you know, you just gotta hope that they're gonna do it right, because how are you gonna know? Well, that's money you're not going to get back because it doesn't really increase the value of the house any. It's nothing that you see from the inside. It doesn't add living space. It's just money that you're going to spend to make the air quality in your house and below your house a little bit better.
I got some rough estimates for encapsulating our crawl space, and I was probably looking at around twenty to thirty thousand dollars to get the job done right. Maybe fifteen to twenty for something that wasn't going to be done quite right, and I was never going to be happy with considering the price. It's kind of like a thousand dollar cheeseburger. You know, like it might be really good, but all you're going to be able to taste is the fact that you just spent a thousand dollars on a cheeseburger. So it's never going to be satisfying. That's the same way with crawl space encapsulation. I could just not see myself spending twenty or thirty thousand dollars to have somebody put plastic on the dirt underneath my house. Needless to say, I spent a lot of time thinking this over, discussing it with my wife, lying awake at night, staring at the ceiling, trying to decide what we should do. On one hand, that's a lot of money. $30,000 for something that I'm not going to be able to see or enjoy on a daily basis. On the other hand, that's a lot of work. And the guys who normally do this for a living, from what I've seen watching YouTube videos, they have a crew of much younger men who are going to do a lot of the heavy lifting and dirty work for them. That's smart business right there, but I don't have a crew, it's just me. While I'm not in bad shape, I am certainly not in the condition that I was 20 years ago. Not quite as resilient, I don't bounce quite as much, and after working in a crawl space for a couple weeks, I might not be in the best of moods or feeling so well. So, uh, what to do now, right? Well, at some point, my wife said something that just totally flipped the argument and turned me on my head. She said, if you do this job, and we don't have to hire somebody, you should reward yourself by buying one of those saws that doesn't cut off fingers. She's talking about a saw stop table saw. I've wanted one of those forever, like ever since I heard of it. I, I've had a, the same rigid one and a half horsepower, one, uh, one and three quarter horsepower, whatever it is, table saw for probably 15 years now. And it, it's pretty good, but a three ho a horsepower saw stop, <laughs> that's like a whole new level. And uh, that totally changed the whole thing, because now instead of trying to figure out whether I should pay somebody and how I'm going to pay somebody, it's just a question really of how am I going to get this job done on my own. And while we were having these discussions, I, I did a lot of reading and watched a lot of videos about crawl space encapsulation just to learn everything I could. And I started working on some other mitigation options such as uh, improving the gradient around the house just to try to pull uh, more water away from areas that I thought might be problematic. And I also uh, opened up the vents around the perimeter of the crawl space. Uh, there was about six vents, and they were mostly closed. And they've always been like that since I, I moved in. Never really gave it a lot of thought. But after I opened up those vents, within a week, my radon levels were half of what they were before. Just by opening those up and allowing the air to pass through a little bit more, it removed a lot of that gas. So that hasn't really helped the electricity bill any, but uh, it's nice to know that my family is breathing less radioactive gas now. Uh, another thing I did is uh, installed some downspout extenders so that the you know, rain gutters go down into the downspouts and then pop out the water right there, right next to the foundation. Well, there was a little bit of like a garden enclosed area, and that was holding a lot of water. So I installed uh, you know, some four-inch corrugated pipe to the end of that area and threw it out over top of a sidewalk to get a lot of that, that uh, water away from the house instead of back in through the foundation. And that in itself has made a big improvement. And also, of course, I installed a sump pump and approximately 20 feet of drain pipe in gravel inside the crawl space in the area where I think most of the water is coming in. I think I'm probably right because I haven't seen nearly as much since then. So a lot of the worst of it is already taken care of. I think I've already saved a few thousand dollars with the work that I've done so far. And if I can do a full encapsulation, I'm probably going to save at least another 20,000. I've maybe spent about four or 500 so far with the... Uh, the sump pump, the basin, some corrugated pipe, some gravel, uh, some, some dirt, some grass seed, uh, some plastic sheeting, just, you know, six mil stuff just as a temporary vapor barrier. So not a huge expense, but a whole lot of work. The downside that it's a lot of hard work and it's very unpleasant work. So for the sump pump to be fully effective, what I really want to do is put a drainage pipe all the way around the perimeter of the inside of the crawl space. I got about 20 feet in right now, just in the area where I think most of the water was coming from, and I'm pretty sure after several months that I'm still right about that. I want to go around about 140 feet of perimeter. Well, that's inside like a 30 inch, uh, 30 inch area or so, where I'm going to be sitting down, digging a trench, putting all this dirt into to a bucket or some container, and hauling it out of the house. Altogether, it's probably going to be about two or three tons of dirt that I need to remove. I could just spread it around on the inside, but uh, there's already uh, you know 
too little space as it is, so that's not going to make it any better if I just spread it around. And uh, also there's a lot of construction debris down there. You can't just spread that out. I have to actually remove it. Cinder blocks, bricks, trash, you know, everything the builder left under there because sometimes that's just a common practice. Well, after all that's done, I need to bring two to three tons of gravel back in to fill in 140 feet of trench and put all that uh, corrugated pipe in there. So two to three tons of material out on my hands and knees, two to three tons of material back in on my hands and knees, and I'm lacking a crew of young underpaid workers to do that kind of stuff for me. What's up, old man? So I got to come up with a much better solution. One day when I was hauling some dirt around on the crawl space, I remembered that I had uh, made something several years ago for moving heavy objects. And it was just a couple two by fours screwed together with some threaded rod through the middle and some wheels on either side. And I, I attached various things to that for, uh, you know, depending on the job I was trying to get done, but I've used it to move logs, I've used it to move an elliptical machine, just, you know, any kind of heavy object that needs, needs to be rolled. I added a handle to it this time and put on a small platform and that allowed me to set bags of things and buckets on top of it and that way at least I was rolling things around instead of picking them up and moving them a couple feet at a time. This is wet clay and cinder blocks and bricks and, uh, and mud that I'm talking about so it's very heavy because of the water content. That saved a lot of effort but I still had to crawl around on my hands and knees. Even though the knee pads helped, they're not really designed for distance crawling. And uh, I still got to pull that thing or push it one way or the other. It increases breathing and sweating when you're wearing a mask in an area that already has poor air quality. So it wasn't really the final solution. I knew that I had to find something that was going to be motorized and do some of that pushing or pulling for me. to go but it's working. I had some ideas and I was pretty excited to get started but really before I could start building a prototype I needed to figure out what my unique basic minimum requirements were because there's really no guarantee this thing is going to be even possible even at this stage. First of all it's going to be used in an enclosed space so that means that there can't be any fumes that eliminates gas powered so this is going to need to be powered either by a plug-in electrical connection or batteries. An extension cord is going to be kind of tough when you're trying to maneuver around, so I think that batteries are the way to go. I've seen several videos and pictures online of cordless drill-powered go-karts, so from a proof-of-concept perspective, it seems like that should be possible, but that brings us on to requirement number two. It has to be able to carry at least 350 pounds. That includes the weight of the vehicle, the weight of the operator, and the weight of whatever materials I'm trying to transport. It's a lot of weight it's going to put a little bit more strain on an 18 volt drill. Next it needs to have a very low profile. I have about 33 inches of headroom down there I think and that's not in the areas where the main beam and the air conditioning duct runs across the length of the house. I believe that's closer to 22, 23 inches. I know that my hand truck with a bucket on top will fit underneath as long as I don't overfill the bucket so that's really about where my limit is right there and I'm going to be riding on this thing. Requirement number four, this isn't going to be an open road vehicle for driving on smooth asphalt. That's a bit more easy. This is going to be an off-road vehicle for driving in a congested space, potentially on top of plastic sheeting. So it needs to be able to turn tight, needs to be able to move across slippery plastic and uneven terrain, carrying a lot of weight without tearing up the plastic. And lastly, if this wasn't simple enough already, it needs to get into the crawl space opening, which is 26 inches wide and 18 inches tall. So it's got to be wide enough to carry me, and it's got to be narrow enough to fit through the crawl space opening. And those are my requirements. And finally, that brings us to the 10th version, probably, of the cordless drill powered crawl space caddy. The first physical version was done on foam board after I did a lot of sketches on paper and in PowerPoint. And uh, this has gone through a few evolutions, including the use of, uh, of wooden axles even. And I still have the wooden gears on here, and that's probably going to change later because that uh, creates a bit of extra friction that I don't want. But uh, let's take a look at how well we're meeting the requirements so far. First, we can't have any fumes. So that requirement is already met by using this 18-volt cordless drill on here. This has worked out pretty well driving on smooth roads. 
it's going to be a little bit more challenging working inside a crawl space on rough terrain carrying heavy loads. So this thing might need to be upgraded. And since my wife has been pretty tolerant of my shenanigans so far throughout this whole thing, next version is going to be quite a bit beefier. It needs to haul about 350 pounds, and that includes 230 pounds of me, about 60 pounds of this, and whatever cargo I put on there. Now, my wife has been pretty tolerant throughout this whole thing so far, but she's also kind of been on my back a little bit to get it done, so really need to keep moving. Thank you. It needs to be very low profile, and right now I have it at about 2 inches, but once again, and the reason it has to be low profile is because I need to be on it and fit underneath things. So let's see how we're doing in that department. Nope. Nope again. All right, obviously there's still a little design work to do there, or I can just try to convince my wife to drive it for me. So I'll be doing some design work. It needs to be maneuverable in confined rough terrain, so that's why I went with articulated steering, meaning the front is separated from the back, and that allows me to get a pretty tight turning radius, and it also provides the added benefit of, instead of the wheels shifting like that on the, on the plastic and digging into the ground, the wheels can actually turn as I'm doing the steering. Now I can definitely improve this mechanism somewhat, but for the most part, this is working out pretty well. Uh, it's not the style that I would use if I was doing this for, uh, for smooth terrain or for speed, but for all-terrain work, this is the way to go. And lastly, it needs to fit through that 26-inch crawl space opening. we got about 26 inches on the front wheels. Quite a bit more than 26 inches on the rear wheels, so the way to get around that problem and still be able to fit on there myself is just to make it collapsible. Now it can fit through the crawl space door, put it back together on the other side, and you're ready to go. As you can see, there's still a little work to be done, but I think it's coming along pretty nicely, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the finished product turns out to be. I certainly welcome any suggestions, good ideas, diagrams, and uh, in the meantime, I will just keep procrastinating the job that I don't want to do. At least I got the worst issues resolved with the water and the radon gas, so that's a few steps in the right direction. Thanks for watching. See you next time.